Hello and welcome once again to my channel, Ledveria Library, where I talk about anything and everything comic book related. Now it's no secret that I love the more mystical and weirder side of the DC Comics universe. Swamp Thing is literally one of my favorite characters, and there are so many video ideas I have for him. But today I want to focus on the history of a character that was first introduced in the pages of Swamp Thing, John Constantine. In this first part, I want to go over his first appearances, his origins, and some of my favorite stories in order. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and let's get into the video. John Constantine first premiered in the Saga of Swamp Thing on issue 37 in 1985, and was created by writer Alan Moore, artist Stephen Bessett, artist Rick Vetch, and illustrator John Tolbin. Alan Moore started working on the character after Steve and John, who were big fans of the band Police, expressed wanting to add a character to the series who looked like the lead singer Sting. For those first appearances, Moore depicts the character as a chain-smoking, morally questionable sorcerer, which was later expanded upon by multiple writers. But we will get into that later. For now, Let's start with the first Swamp Thing story Constantine appears in, American Gothic. Now I've covered a quite a bit of this story before in my Avatars of the DC Universe video, so I'll just give you a quick rundown basically. Constantine has heard about a very old and powerful dark entity resurfacing. Wanting to know more about this entity, he starts traveling around the world asking his magic related contacts if they know anything about it. He's told a South American cult that worships this entity is going to awaken it. And to gather enough energy to do that, they will have to increase the belief levels of Earth's population. To do this, they will use werewolves, vampires, evil spirits, so on and so forth. It will be about a year before they'll be able to awaken it. Knowing he needed help, Constantine travels to Louisiana to meet with Abby and Swamp Thing. John knows all about Swamp Thing and what he is. He tells him that he's connected to all plant life and can regrow himself anywhere in the world. But if he wanted to know more, he would have to meet him in Rosewood, Illinois in a week. Meanwhile, John's girlfriend has been having visions and drawing a man with his head twist backwards. While John is in Louisiana, she is attacked by this same man and she falls out of her apartment window and dies. Turns out that man was sent by the cult. This will be a reoccurring theme in the Hellblazer comics. Everybody that gets close to Constantine ends up dead or worse, usually due to his own selfishness in some way. But more on that later. A week passes and Swamp Thing meets John in a swamp in Rosewood. He tells Swamp Thing about a vampire colony underwater and asks him to take care of them. And in return, perhaps he would tell him more about the green. Frustrated with John's games, but having no other choice, he agrees. After the job was done, Constantine tells him that he failed because he let a family escape to tell what they saw. Therefore, he wouldn't tell Swamp Thing anything. This happens a few more times. Constantine tricks Swamp Thing into cleaning up some supernatural mess, then leaves without telling him anything. But finally, because of the crisis event and the effect it had on not only the physical world, but also the spiritual dimensions, the cult could gather enough magical energy to awaken their dark god, which was their plan all along. They have known about the coming crisis for a very long time. Their goal is to destroy heaven. So it was finally time to confront the cult, but Constantine had a promise to keep. So him and Swamp Thing make a detour and end up in the Amazon rainforest. There Swamp Thing learns about the Parliament of Trees, what he is, and his purpose. After, him and John head to South America to confront the cult with the Newcastle crew, who we will learn about later. But unfortunately, they fail their mission. Judith, one of the Newcastle crew, is transformed into the Messenger, who is the entity that is supposed to wake up the Dark God. And the rest of them are killed. With no way of stopping the oncoming threat, 
John and Swamp Thing split up to recruit magic users to help them in their fight. While Swamp Thing and his army of angels and demons, thanks to Etrigan and the Phantom Stranger, fight off the evil old god in hell, Constantine and the mages use a psychic named Mento as a conduit to send their magical energies to aid Swamp Thing from Earth. But unfortunately, this great darkness was far too powerful. It lashes out at Constantine and the mages, killing Sargon and Zatara. While in hell, not even the Spectre, one of the most powerful beings in the universe, could defeat it. It wasn't until the light from the heavens reached out and accepted the darkness that it was finally snuffed out. I remember reading this story for the first time when I was in middle school. It was just so beautiful and imaginative and hard not to be in that moment or think of anything else. The writing is so eloquent and the art is gorgeous and dark. It complements the writing so well. I know I really didn't do this story justice. There is a lot going on at once and this video would be two hours long if I covered everything. I know I say this a lot, but if you are going to read a comic, this is the one to read. But back to Constantine. We don't learn much in the story about him, but we do get some hints. Like during the crisis issue, he mentions a new castle exorcism and ending up in a mental hospital afterwards. Which we will learn a lot about during Hellblazer and how it's the driving force that guides his decisions. And at the end of American Gothic, he has a moment that kind of sums up his character. Swamp Thing says to him that he knew the danger and that most of his comrades wouldn't survive. And John tells him that he did what he had to do. And I'll just leave this story at that. After American Gothic, Constantine became a reoccurring character in the saga of Swamp Thing. Eventually, the character became so popular with readers that in 1988, the character starred in his own series, helmed by creative team writer Jamie Delano and artist John Ridgway, with artist Dave McKinnon creating most of the cover art. It was called Hellblazer and went on to be the longest running Vertigo title, having some of the best writers in the game over the years. Also, what's kind of interesting about the Hellblazer comics is that John actually ages throughout the series. I thought I would mention that because you don't really see that much in comics, and it also adds a layer of realism to the character. The best place to start would be the first two issues. I thoroughly enjoy them and they tie to the previous story I just went over. In these issues we get to know a little bit more about John and the past decisions that still haunt him. Plus we also get introduced to a few important reoccurring characters. John arrives at his flat and is greeted by his landlady, Mrs. M. She tells him that he has a friend waiting for him upstairs, the druggy one, Gary Lester. John heads upstairs and finds Gary in his bathtub covered in bugs, begging for a fix. Obviously shocked, John runs out of the flat to the corner store to buy bug spray and borrow a phone. He then calls his best friend and partner, Chaz, for backup. When he finally arrives, him and John tie down Gary and John begins to hypnotize him. While under hypnotism, Gary begins to recount an encounter with a demon named Mind Moth and how he ended up at John's place to begin with. The story begins with Gary looking for a fix on the streets of Medina, Saudi Arabia. He runs into a mute kid with strange tattoos. Gary can tell he's been possessed by something and an overwhelming need to exorcise the demon overtakes Gary. But during the exorcism, he realizes that the demon wants out. Thousands of bugs start pouring out of the boy. And finally, Gary is able to bind it to a bottle. But the boy didn't survive. The demon can feel Gary's need for a fix and begins to talk to him. It says its name's My Moth. Having trouble resisting the demon, Gary knew he needed some help. So he hops on a plane and heads to John. But he wasn't there. So Gary waited, but all the time he was tormented by the demon and his addiction. It begged to be released, tried to make a deal. Gary couldn't take it anymore, so he had Mrs. M send it to John while he was in America. Constantine snaps him back to reality, 
then asks him to draw the boy. He then asks Chaz to babysit Gary while he heads out to meet with a professor that dabbles in the occult. Maybe he would know something about the tattoos on the boy's face. He's told that the tattoos are a binding spell used by the Dinka tribe. So John jumps on a plane and heads to Africa. Then walks for what feels like forever until he comes to a village that points him in the direction of a shaman's hut. The shaman's powers are tied to the hut, so he will have to teach John the binding spell through a vision. In the vision, he also sees the story of the boy and how Maimont fed on his hunger until he was no more. John knows what he has to do now and heads back to England to pick up Gary, then heads to America hoping that Papa Midnight, a New York City crime lord and witch doctor, would help him get rid of the demon. After a long journey, they finally end up at Papa Midnight's nightclub, and knowing they probably wouldn't get in, they sneak through a side door and take the elevator upstairs. They finally reach Papa Midnight and tell him what's going on, but he already could feel the demon's influence spreading throughout the city. Papa was reluctant to help because let's just say him and John are not on good terms. But John convinced him that having a demon rampaging through the city would be bad for business. John leaves Gary with Papa Midnight and he asks Gary if he could trust John. And Gary says, with my life. Remember that because it will be important later. John walks down a familiar street until he gets to a familiar studio apartment. He doesn't want to go inside because it brings back too many memories and too many regrets. But unfortunately he has to because it's the place where Gary told Mrs. M to send the bottle holding the demon. He walks up the steps to Emma's apartment, his girlfriend that was killed by the cult in Saga Swamp Thing. The new tenant opens the door and John can still smell her oils and paint. He then walks to the window where she fell and turns around. Her death had inspired the new tenant and John sees the painting. A bitterness rises in his throat and he realizes the only thing left there were nightmares. So he leaves. But the guilt must be really getting to him because behind him Emma's ghost was standing. They talk for a while and she tells him the whole crew was there and that she's here to help with Mind Moth. They start down the street and John realizes he's the most relaxed he's been in a while until he comes across one of my moth's victims. They follow the trail left behind by the demon and it leads him to a church. The demon was inside, about to devour its next victim, a priest. John tries to fight it off, but his magic isn't strong enough, so he runs, leaving the priest to be taken. Continued in issue 2. Seeing how powerless he was against the demon, John knew he had to move fast, and really needed Papa Midnight's help. So he returns to the club and him and Papa head downstairs to check on Gary. He was in a cage begging for a fix. John explains to him that his knee will lure Mind Moth to them. They were going to use Gary as bait. He pleads for his life and John tries to convince himself that it's the only way and that Gary is responsible for all of this anyway. He tells Gary to trust him, that he's never let him down. But John knew Gary wouldn't make it out of this alive. The fight with the hunger spirit begins at dawn, and barely being able to walk, John drags his exhausted body to the cheap hotel he rented out. Before bed, nature was calling, so he heads to the bathroom, and Sister Anne Marie's ghost, another friend that was killed by the cult, was standing in the doorway, and the new castle crew, Ben, Franklin, and Emma, appeared behind him. He asked what they want, but they just stared at him. He screams and yells, but they still say nothing. He apologizes for the cult killing them, but that wasn't what they were there for. It was about Gary Lester. They don't want him to end up like them. Constantine has sacrificed too many of his friends for this fight. But John tells him that Gary brought it on himself, and wishes there was another way. But he will deal with the burden of guilt, just like he deals with the guilt over them. He shuts the lights off and begins to sob into his pillow. Finally the morning comes. John is awakened by one of Papa's zombie servants and they both head to the club. They then head to the top floor 
and Constantine helps Papa prepare for the exorcism, while the zombies bring Gary to the roof. They strap him to an old electric chair, and Papa begins their ritual. He starts to chant, and suddenly from a distance they see a dark cloud made of bugs headed towards them. It was the hunger spirit. It whirls around them and can feel Gary's hunger. It homes in on him and suddenly enters his mouth. John's able to bind it to him, but then Gary breaks free and attacks John. John yells at him to fight it and says that, I'm your friend. Finally that snaps Gary out of it and he's able to fight back the demon. One of the zombies puts a straitjacket on him and they take him back to the cell. John, after downing a bottle of whiskey, stays with him as the demon devours him from the inside. Finally, it was done. John wakes up in a pool of his own vomit and he sees Gary's body. It was completely mummified, eyes too dry to close. But at least the ghost stopped following him. This is a really good introduction to the series. I see this story less about stopping the demon and more about John and some of the demons he's struggling with. Even though he does have many regrets, he still soldiers on, saving the world no matter what it takes, like sacrificing a friend if he has to. I love a hero that sees things as morally gray. It makes the character more interesting and realistic. Because really, life is morally gray most of the time. So to me, it makes it easy to relate to him. Now two characters we will see often going forward is Chaz and Papa Midnight. Chaz is a taxi driver and John's oldest friend. He's also John's main form of transportation. But he likes to keep him away from the more dangerous aspects of his job for obvious reasons. We will go over more of his backstory probably in the next video. Now for Papa Midnight. He's the world's greatest expert on the occult, especially with curses and necromancy. But also he owns a nightclub that's a front for more nefarious endeavors. Him and John are usually rivals, but they still work together from time to time if it's beneficial for them both. We will be seeing more of Papa in future videos. For now, the last thing I would like to cover in this video is the Newcastle Incident. It starts in issue 11 and it's a flashback during a story where John is having trouble with a demon called Nergal. He realizes that he's had trouble with this demon before in Newcastle years ago. It starts with John's team slash band, Frank, Judith, and Marie. This is before she was a nun, Richie, Gary, and Benjamin. After a gig, the club owner, Alex Logue, invited them to a chapel he also owned to get drunk and do a little magic with some of his buddies. They agreed after seeing his daughter's pale face and eyes staring into nothing like a doll. Plus Alex was well known in occult circles and Newcastle has had reports of weird disturbances. It seemed like the most obvious place to investigate. They hear a sound coming from the cellar and decide to check it out. But what they found would be something they would never forget. Bodies ripped to shreds. Hard to say how many, but John counted at least four separate heads. Suddenly, they hear screaming from upstairs and rush to see what's happening. It was Logue's daughter, Astra. She had seen the horrors downstairs and was screaming and flailing. John and Anne try to settle her down so she can be hypnotized. They needed to find out what happened down there. Under hypnosis, she tells them her father would touch her and make her participate in magic and orgies. She begged and pleaded for help and finally something responded to her cries. It rips everybody in the room apart and begins to eat them. John finally brings her out of the trance and puts her to sleep. It was an elemental nightmare created by Astra. John says it should be dormant as long as she's asleep. He then tells the crew the only way to stop it is to raise a really powerful demon from hell. Nervous but willing to try, they ask John how, and he tells them with the Grimorium Vernum, it had the ritual spelled out like ABC. Judith and Gary agree to help. Anne-Marie looks after the girl, 
and the rest don't want anything to do with it. Constantine tells Frank to rig a gas tank outside so they can blow the place up if anything goes wrong. Then tells Gary to try and find a black cat, but then changes his mind. Meanwhile, him and Judith prepare. Finally, the ritual begins. They finish and wait, but nothing happens. John tries to chant again, but still nothing happens. Meanwhile, upstairs, Anne-Marie and Astra sit in a protection circle when a portal opens, and it was John. He seduces her, tells her to come to him. You see, Anne-Marie was in love with John. This is what she's always wanted. So she crawls towards him, leaving the protection circle. But it wasn't John. He sprays her in the face with something that looks like acid maybe? She screams and jumps out the second story window. Constantine tries one last time to summon the demon when Astra interrupts, saying that he called for her. But he never did. Gary says he will take her back to the protection circle upstairs, but John yells at him saying, nobody breaks this circle. But then Astra awakens a terror elemental and it busts through the floor. She then calls for it and it moves towards her, but Astra rips off his head. Fear consumes John. He realizes the ritual did work and the demon had taken control of Astra. He commands the demon to obey him and to leave the girl. The demon says he has obeyed. He came even though John wasn't able to summon him. He even dispatched the evil corrupt deformity. John says once again, leave her, and the demon says very well. Astra then vomits up a grotesque creature akin to something in a Lovecraft story. The demon tells Constantine, he cannot constrain him. The root of his power is in the name, and John does not know his name. As payment for helping, the demon wants Astra's soul. John tells him to take his instead, but the demon says he already owns his, and there is no negotiating. A portal to hell opens, and John chases the demon through. He finds Astra in there. They escape hell, or so John thought. He escaped with just Astra's arm. The demon laughs and says, that this is just a taste of their eventual home. Constantine ends up in a mental hospital for two years after this incident. John has done a lot of bad things over the years, but this is one of the only things he regrets. Not only did it lead to a young girl's soul being trapped in hell, but it really messed up everybody in his crew, eventually leading to their deaths. A lot of people say that John fights demons and dabbles in magic because he is an adrenaline junkie, which is true to an extent, but I also think it's because of this moment. He wants to make up for his past mistakes, maybe even try to save his soul, at least at this point in the story maybe. That's why he tries so hard. I don't think he would if he was just an adrenaline junkie. This is the end of part one. If you made it this far and enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.